Now, I introduced the book this morning, so the introduction's already done, and that means this will be a much shorter message tonight. <clears throat> this, is, this is what I said this morning, that the first two chapters of the book of Malachi are called Disputes. And what you need to know is that the one who's being disputed with is God. Now, I don't, know, I don't know about you, but just to say those words, it, it does something to me. It strikes a little fear in my heart. But we do it. I'm just being real with us. We, we sometimes want to argue with God. And uh, I've had situations as a pastor where it wasn't, you know, I was counseling with somebody and it wasn't about, well, this is what the pastor believes or this is what uh, this or that, but this is what the Bible says. And somebody says, well, uh, I don't see it that way. Well, well I, okay, that's, that's fair enough, but this is what the Bible says. <laughs> this is what God says. And so watch how these conversations go here in Malachi chapter 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. God says, this is how he starts. What an amazing thing. God starts like this. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Keep in mind, this is 100 years after they've returned from captivity and things are as bad or worse now than they were before captivity as far as relationship with God. And God still starts off with these words, I have loved you. And this is what they said. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? You see the argumentative nature here? God says, I have loved you. They said, prove it. God says, okay, well, I will. Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Talking about Esau, remember, he was the firstborn who should have received the birthright and the blessing, and he received neither. You say, yeah, because Jacob was a trickster. Well, if you want to know the truth, he didn't receive either because God had a plan for Israel. God was already aware of all of that, and he had already chosen Jacob over Esau. He said, yet I love Jacob and I hated Esau. Now that doesn't mean God looked at Esau with hatred, but understand, especially in the Old Testament, when you see the word loves, love and hate, they have everything to do with the priority with which God dealt with them in regards to his sovereign plan. And yes, God does have a sovereign plan that man cannot frustrate and man can't get in the middle of. And he said, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness, verse 4, whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will, throw, I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. Verse 6. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest, that despise my name? And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? So God said, you've despised my name. They said, how? In other words, they said, no, we haven't. Ye offered polluted bread upon my altar. And ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, now he's not talking about a blind person, but like a blind animal. And if you go back and read earlier in the Old Testament, the sacrifice that was to be given to the Lord was, to, was supposed to be set apart and, and, and even enclosed in a different uh, uh, fence and everything and kept separate. And he was supposed to be without spot and without blemish. And you say, why? Because he was supposed to be a picture or a type of the coming uh, sinless sacrifice of Jesus Christ. 
But God here says, and if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? Would everybody look up here for just a second? Because this really gets right down to where we live and how we think about God here. There are times in our relationship with God and the way we talk to God and the way we worship God and the way we want to show honor and praise and glory to God. Watch this. We give more honor to people than we give to God. We treat God in ways that we would never treat somebody who we esteem worthy of honor in our own society, in our own country, in our own life. But i got to tell you something tonight. God is higher than any governor of any state in this country. And God is higher and God is better and worthy of more honor than any president the United States has ever had. Has ever had. And God is high and lifted up. And when God is going to talk to the people through Malachi in his day, God said, God said, there are things you wouldn't offer the governor and you're giving those things to God. I, I'm just, can we just be real in here tonight? What does that look like? What does that look like when there's some person uh, that, that the world gives honor to, that the world gives respect to, that the world says is worthy of dignity, and we're ready to lay out the red carpet and absolutely do our best if we ever have the chance to meet them or, or commune with them or, or, or uh, see them. And I'm telling you, we live in a country that, that there are so many idols all around us and I'm not talking about statues, and I'm not talking about carvings, but I'm talking about uh, uh, people, athletes, governmental figures. And people are just like, oh, wow, I got to meet them. I, I just, that's unbelievable. And, and I've had opportunity to meet some pretty neat people in my lifetime. I've had the opportunity to speak to some governmental leaders. And I've had the opportunity to uh, correspond with people of, that, that would be considered of high degree and, and things like that. But let me just say something. If I treat them with more respect than I treat the God of the universe, that's a problem. If I'm willing to lay out my absolute best to impress some man, why don't I do that? For God. Why do we sometimes treat God so casually? Can I suggest tonight it might stem from a problem in how we think about God? And that's, that's what Malachi is talking about right here. He said, you're offering, you're offering sacrifices to God that you would be ashamed to offer that as meat on the governor's table. And then he goes, on, he goes on to say, and as a matter of fact, you know that the governor wouldn't be impressed with it. So what makes you think God is? Boy, we... It seems like today in our society, we've been told so often that God doesn't care about the externals. I've heard it out of context so much, I'm almost sick of it. The verse that, well, man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. All right, so let's just talk about the heart for a second. The Bible says that, that, that it's what comes out of a man that defiles him. Let, let me just put it like this quite succinctly. Whatever's in your heart will show up on the outside. 
Whatever's on your heart will show up in your behavior. Whatever's in your heart will show up in, in the way you present yourself. This is a fact. And, well, let's not get caught up in external appearances and things like that. But if my external appearance indicates that I have a heart who considers something very casual that should not be considered casual, isn't that a problem? Well, it was a problem in Malachi's day. God wasn't, God, God had already said, he even says in the book of Malachi, and he had said in many previous prophets, I, I don't even care about the sacrifices that you bring. You say, well, if he didn't care about the sacrifices that they bring, then why does he care about this? Well, I'll tell you the truth. He would rather, rather them not sacrifice but have a right heart toward him than sacrifice something so casual and flippant and manifest a heart that they really don't care. And that's, that's what he's dealing with here. He says here in verse number 9, And now I pray you beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This hath been, your, uh, this hath been by your means. Will he regard your person, saith the Lord of hosts? Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle fire on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. Can you matter how much his stung, uh, this, this stung, when Malachi said to God's people, that God's name is esteemed greater among the heathen than it is among his people. I'm going to leave this for you to think about and come up to, with your own determination. But is it just possible today that maybe there's some uh, non-Christians that actually have a higher thought of God than some people who claim to be his child? You said, Preacher, I don't think you said that right. I mean, if they're not Christians, then they probably don't think of God at all. No, hang on just a second. I know a lot of non-Christian people that at least have respect for God. And, it, and it, it's demonstrated in their life and the way they live their life. Sometimes more so than Christian people. It's just possible. Verse 12, but ye have profaned it, talking about his name, in that ye say the table of the Lord is polluted and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. Ye said also, behold, what a weariness is it, exclamation point. And ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And ye brought that which was torn and the lame and the sick Thus ye brought an offering, should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? So this, is, this was the next thing. The, the first thing was they're bringing things that they wouldn't even give to people that they esteem highly and hold in high regard. The second thing was they considered the worship of the Lord a weariness. Uh, let me translate for you. A waste of their time. Think about this. We got more important things to do. This morning I invited you to be here tonight and I'm glad you came. Uh, but sometimes we can think I've got more important things to do. This, this worship of the Lord, this time we spend in his word, this singing, this praise, this is a weariness. Well, maybe the problem's not with the worship or with the church. Maybe the problem's something in here. Maybe we need to reestablish some priorities. I mean, God, look, this is the last book in the Old Testament before Jesus comes. And God's just laying it out. God said, God said there's a problem here, and one of the problems is 
you don't think of me as highly as you do some men. And then he said, and when it comes to the, uh, the service and the worship of the Lord, you've got greater priorities than that, and worshiping the Lord is a weariness to you. It's a grind. I get it. No, I, no, I know. You say, preacher, you, you don't understand. You're the pastor. You, you have to be here. Well, I, I, I'm being honest with you when I say it, it does. It is a load sometimes. I mean, I, I know the jokes about it only works two days a week. Sunday and Wednesday. There's a little bit more to it than that. And I have known pastors, and I'm just being honest with you, I have been tempted myself to think of the weekly grind as weariness. But you know what I found? That was never a problem with the church or anybody in the church. That was never a problem with God. It's always been a problem with me. It's always been a problem with the way I'm looking at something. And if I'll let God adjust my perspective, all of a sudden, it's not a weariness, it's a joy. Amen. It's not a weariness, it's a necessity. You ever been there? Like where church attendance and the worship of the Lord, I need it. I got to have it. I mean, if I get sick and I providentially am hindered and can't make it, I feel lean. I feel anemic. Well, for one, I can tell you this, I never can figure out what day of the week it is. If something happens and I have to miss a service, I cannot determine what day of the week it is until Sunday comes around and my clock resets. Because it's that big of a part of my life. And you can say, well, that's because you're the pastor. But I'm telling you, I was like that when I wasn't a pastor. Well, yeah, but then you were a preacher's kid and you didn't have a choice. And I went to church a lot because I didn't have a choice. That's the truth. I went through a period of years of my life. I'm not proud of it. But I went through a period of years of my life where if I had have had the opportunity to do something different, I would have. I have been in that place as an older teenage guy where, where there were a lot of things that were more important to me at the time. And I have, I have slept through services. I have daydreamed through services only to turn around and look and think, oh, that I had paid closer attention because there was probably something there I really, really needed. We just had the Triumph Youth Conference this past weekend. Preaching was outstanding. And I did sit there for a moment, and I was telling Brother Zach about this. Boy, he hammered on one point about being in the far country with the prodigal son. And he pointed out in the text that with the timing of this young man getting his inheritance, and the next thing you know, he's in the far country and he's wasting it with, wasting his substance with riotous living. Brother Park pointed out that with the, such a small time frame of how everything fell out, it's pretty obvious that this young man was already in the far country here long before he was ever actually in the far country. And when Brother Park preached that on Friday night, and I was sitting there listening to that, I was sitting there, and all of a sudden, I wasn't a 42-year-old pastor of South Campbell Avenue Baptist Church. I was a 16-year-old boy sitting in Grace Baptist Church in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And my mind was sitting in a church service, and I was thinking about the basketball game we were going to play right after the final amen was said. And it was, it was like, when he said that, it wasn't like I was thinking, man, I hope these kids are hearing this. I was thinking, that was me. 
I remember those days. I wasn't in a far country yet because I didn't have the opportunity. But my mind was already gone. My mind was already thinking of other things. And I sat through many church services thinking of the weariness that church was to me. But the problem wasn't that God was boring or that I didn't really need what was being said or sung about. The problem was right in here. My focus was off. I saw things like I wanted to see them. And if I could sum up the idea of the entire book of Malachi, it would be this. We see what we want to see. So when God speaks, we see what we want to see. God says, I love you. No, you don't. Well, why, do, why would somebody say that? Well, because they're thinking about this trial and they're thinking about this hardship and all they're thinking about is the negativities of life. And when the negativities are all you think about, it's easy for Satan to come along and deceive you into thinking that God doesn't love you at all. But it's not because God doesn't love you. It's because you have the wrong perspective. It's because you're only seeing what you want to see. And then God comes along and says, and you, you've wearied me with your sacrifices. And they said, no, we haven't. Why? Because they see themselves as dutifully carrying out the word of the Lord. Well, wait a minute. You and I know that they were not sacrificing like God said. But let me just tell you, that doesn't matter to somebody who sees what they want to see. Because if we want to convince ourselves that we're doing the right thing, we can easily do that because what we do is we block out everything that God said and we just convince ourselves that we're doing the right thing and we, we, we do this by only choosing to see what we want to see. And the truth is, every one of us are really good at it. We're really good at it. When I was reading and studying through these chapters of the book of Malachi, I thought back to, oh, it's been a couple years ago, several years ago, <clears throat> I thought back to uh, when uh, somebody had sent me a video link and said, Pastor, this is a couple on YouTube, they do Bible studies, T take a listen and tell me what you think. And so it, it was a young uh, millennial couple that's not necessarily bad. But they were very millennial. If you're not millennial, you don't know what that means. If you are millennial, you know that they were, they were hip. They were with it. And so they had a following, and they were doing, they were doing Bible studies uh, on, on uh, YouTube. So I watched this video. And one of the videos that I watched, here they are. They're, they're a heterosexual married couple. And they had, if you comment, then they try to answer your question with a Bible study. And so somebody commented about homosexuality, and so they did a video on homosexuality, and they went back into the Old Testament, and they brought up Old Testament verses, they brought up New Testament verses, and they demonstrated how, according to God's Word, Old and New Testament, homosexuality is, is a sin, it is wrong, it is a defiance of the way that God created us. And they said, now, look, we, we know that there's a lot of people say that most of these verses are Old Testament and so they don't really matter anymore. But Old Testament does not make them wrong. It doesn't make them less true. God said so in the Old Testament. God doesn't change. And therefore, what was wrong in the Old Testament is wrong in the New Testament. And homosexuality is a sin. And now, now the reason I keep pointing this out is because I'm going somewhere. So this heterosexual couple just lays it out. From the Bible about how God feels about homosexuality. Wasn't a bad video. What they said was right. What they said was true. The next video in the list was someone had asked about tattoos. 
And I thought, well, this will be interesting because I'd noticed in the first video that the wife had quite a few tattoos. And so I thought this would be interesting. And so I watched the next video that's about tattoos. Now, I don't, what I'm illustrating here is not these particular points. I'm not preaching about homosexuality tonight. I'm not preaching about tattoos. So I don't want us to get too sidetracked here. These are just examples. But just in case somebody wonders, I don't believe that a child of God should get tattoos. Now, nor do I believe, and listen very careful to my wording here, nor do I believe that a child of God who has tattoos is any less of a child of God. I've said that very carefully. I do not believe biblically that a child of God should get tattoos, nor do I believe that a child of God who has tattoos is any less of a child of God. So I, that's where I'm at on that. But what they did was they went and they brought up Old Testament scriptures that had to do with marking yourself and your body and things like that. And this is what they said. They said, well, we know that this is what this Old Testament passage says. But as we know, that's Old Testament. And we're not necessarily bound to that anymore. And so things are different now. And so we don't really see it as a problem. Now, do you see why I kept pointing out that this heterosexual couple had no problem saying how homosexuality was wrong according to the scripture because, well, that didn't pertain to them. That wasn't a problem for them. But when it came to something that God's word speaks about that they felt differently about, they had no problem saying the exact opposite of what they said about the previous subject and just glazing over it and saying it's okay. Now, regardless of where you're at on either of those issues, those issues are not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is this. We see what we want to see. This is a major problem that stems ultimately from how we think about God. We see, even in his word, what we want to see. Pastoring for 18 years, can't tell you how many times somebody's come along, said, Pastor, i got a question for you. All right, what's the question? Um, Pastor, I can't find a scripture anywhere in the Bible that says that I can't drink alcohol. And I say this, why do you want to drink alcohol? And then they say this, uh, who said I want to drink alcohol? And then I say this, because you wouldn't ask me that question if you didn't want to drink alcohol. Nobody who's ever didn't want to drink alcohol has ever come to me and said, I can't find where you can't in the Bible anywhere. So, let's study it. Let's see what the Bible does have to say. And so you show them a passage. And because they're already YouTube Bible scholars on the subject, they already have their answers programmed for about every passage that you're going to go to. And then they come to this conclusion. Now, Pastor, see, it doesn't say that I can't drink alcohol. It says it's unwise. Well, hang on just a second. Who wants to do something that's not wise? No, no, don't you say over, yeah, I know, I know. I knew you were going to go to Proverbs 30. I knew you were going to go there. But see, that was written to Lemuel, and that was about kings. You know what they're doing? They're seeing what they want to see. They, they, 
They, want, they, they say, no, look, Pastor, if you could show me a verse that says, thou shalt not consume alcohol, and I don't say this, but this is what I think, you'd still find a way around it. You know why? Because we see what we want to see. And we dismiss what we want to see. What we want to dismiss. Well, the Bible doesn't say anywhere that this is wrong. And the reason that you're studying the Bible in that way is not so that you can find out how to live. But when a person is approaching the Bible from that perspective, what they're trying to do is get permission to do what they want to do. And if they can't find a verse that says, thou shalt not, they are going to do what they want to do and justify it in their own mind by saying, well, it doesn't say not to. When in reality, you go, you go yourself and you read the passages that have to do with alcohol in the Bible and you come back, look me square in the eye and tell me, that that's a wise decision for a child of God to drink alcohol. You know what I get a lot? I'm just going to stay here on alcohol for a second. You know what I get a lot? Well, Jesus turned water into wine. Get that one a lot. And this is what I say. Study the Bible. Do your homework. I mean just simple word searches and, and a Bible dictionary will help you to see that there is no way Jesus turned that water into an alcoholic beverage for a wedding party. Because if you just look up some words and do some, do some uh, dictionary work in the Bible, you'll see very clearly that the amount of water that Jesus turned into wine was the equivalent of between 120 and 180 gallons of beverage after the party had already been going on for several days. So you're telling me that Jesus, the Son of God, showed up to a wedding feast where people had already been drinking what the Bible calls wine. They had already been drinking what the Bible calls wine for days and then he restocked the bar with 120 to 180 gallons of alcohol. If I could say it the way Brother Dean Herring says it, what a savior. It's absurd. It's absurd. Just some simple word searches and definitions will show you that it was mingled grape juice that they drank at wedding feasts, that they had at parties, I do not believe it was alcohol. You say, well, I, I disagree with that, preacher. I disagree with that. I'm just, I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible says. And what I'm also telling you is that we see what we want to see. This is just one of the issues. But we could go on and on through all kinds of issues. And if we, if we get away from reading the Bible as a roadmap and as a direction for what God has planned for our life and what brings him glory and brings our life good, and we start looking at the Bible as, a, as, a, as an excuse or a prohibition to do what we want to do, I mean, I'm telling you, it's the same Bible, but we're in a dangerous, dangerous position. And what makes it so dangerous is not really what we're reading in the book or how we're reading the book. But what makes us so dangerous is that we have shifted the way that we think about God. And it's become about us and not about Him. And not about Him. Look at what He says here. I, I just want you to see, I'm, I'm, I'm not making this up, I'm not, I'm not blowing it out of proportion. Look what He says here. He says uh, in verse number 17, we were in this verse this morning. 
Ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, Wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, or where is the God of judgment? This is an example. This is a prime example of we see things how we want to see them. If we want God to be the, one, the kind of God that rewards iniquity, then we look out here around us and we find people that are doing what we're doing or what we want to do and say, see, God's blessing them. See, they're not in trouble. See, God's not punishing them. But when we've been wronged and when we've been hurt and all of a sudden we want a God of judgment and we want God to vindicate our cause and somebody else isn't suffering for the wrong that we've done, then we're thinking like this. Where is the God of judgment? Why isn't he vindicating me? Are y'all listening tonight, church? We're not looking for God to be God. We want God to be who we want him to be. We want God to be at our beck and call. God, I want to do what I want to do, and I want you to bless me for it. Well, I can't bless you because I said in my word. Now, I don't care what you said in your word. I see other people getting away with it, and so I want to get away with it too. We see what we want to see. Well, God, why aren't you vindicating me? Lord, I've been embarrassed in this situation. Why aren't you lifting me up? Well, I can't lift you up because you're already lifting yourself up. You're so prideful. I can't lift you up. All I can do is resist you. Well, what gives you that idea? Well, because my word says God resisteth the proud but giveth grace to the humble. You're lifted up with pride. I can do nothing but resist you. Well, God, I don't care about that. I want to be lifted up, so you lift me up. And you put them down. Where is the God of judgment? And the truth is, we're not really looking for God at all. We just want a God who's going to be what we want him to be when we want him to be it. But that's not God. That's an idol. That's not God, that's a false God. So watch what he says here. He says, <clears throat> in verse number uh, 13 of chapter 3, Malachi chapter 3, verse 13. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, what have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said, it is vain to serve God. That means empty. A life of service to God is empty. A life of faithfulness to God is empty. Now, are you hearing this? I could serve God, but I won't get anything out of it. I'll serve God, but I'll never be satisfied. I'll serve God, but there'll be this big void there the whole time. I'll give God my life, and I'll serve God, but I'm going to tell you, it's not going to pan out to anything in my life. And God said, your words have been stout against me. What have we said so much against you? Well, you said it's vain to serve God. That's what they said. That, that for me to devote my life to God is a vain life. Listen, I'm telling you, that could not be the, more, any more the message of this world around us today than anything. And I hate to point this out, but I've been trying not to raise my arms up like this anymore because every clip on YouTube has me doing this right here. So I just framed a perfect YouTube thumbnail right there. But I'm telling you, that's what the world's saying. Hey, don't serve God with your life. That's empty. As compared to what? Sports? As compared to what? Politics? 
as compared to what? The rat race of business? And people are going to say that serving God is empty? Well, let me help you. It is not. It is not vain to serve God. And even if I never saw a blessing from serving God in this life, I'm laying up treasures in heaven, and I believe that with all my heart. It's not all about what we experience down here. But there are things that are worth it over, over yonder. I'm telling you, that's why we sang this morning. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. It's worth it to serve him. It's worth it to be faithful to him. It's worth it to be obedient to his word. Yeah, but look at all the stuff you get to miss out on. I mean, if you live according to God's word and you do things the way God said, then you don't get to have sex before marriage and you don't get to live with somebody before marriage and you don't get to do all that kind of stuff. And I'm telling you, that brings heartache, that brings baggage, that brings problems. When you do it God's way, it works. Let me tell you, it works. Doing it God's way is the right way. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance? <laughs> what profit is there in obeying God, doing it God's way, following his word? I mean, how could that possibly profit us? And that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts. Well, I'll, there's no getting around this. Mourning over sin is a big part of the Christian life. Come on, Jesus himself said, Blessed are they that mourn. Why? For they shall be comforted. But the comfort doesn't come until we mourn. No, no. I don't believe in a prosperity gospel. I don't believe that when you serve God with your whole heart, you never have any sorrow, you never have any sadness. There's no valleys, there's no darkness, there's no problems. I've never said that. God never said that. The only people that say that are people that want your money. And that's the truth. They're selling you a bunch of lies. But the truth is, no, there is sadness, there is sorrow, there is hardship in walking with the Lord, but it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Verse 15, and now we call the proud happy. Oh, they might look happy right now, but it's not over. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Oh, man, I don't have enough time to preach on this tonight. I, don't, I do not have enough time to preach about how our society elevates and set people up for display who are wicked and say, these are role models. These are who young people need to be following. I'm talking about TikTok influencers who provide nothing for a society but our young people are wanting to be like and they do nothing except block traffic and dance in weird ways it's just i'm just talking about reality i sometimes i look at where we're at as a country and i, I know i sound like a really old person i'm only 42 years old but sometimes I look at our society and I think we have lost our ever-loving mind. What in the world are we calling good and right these days? We've, we've lost something. We're missing something. And I can tell you what we're missing. We're missing thinking about God in the right way. See, we're not thinking about God in the right way. If you think that it's vain to serve God, then you're, you don't have the right thoughts of God. If you think that there is no profit in keeping his commandments, 
then you're not thinking right about God. If you think that walking mournfully towards sin and in humility under a high and lofty God, if you think that's wrong, then you're not thinking about God correctly. If you think that the proud are the pinnacle of existence, then you're not thinking about God properly. If you think that the wicked should be elevated, or if you want to be like the wicked who are elevated, then you're not thinking about God properly. Uh, properly. Verse 16. This is the last verse. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that Feared the Lord. Let me stop right there. I talked about this this morning, so I'm not going to preach on it for a long time. But they had a reverential respect of the Lord and a fear of the consequences of not living according to his way. Watch this. And I'm going to go back and read this so we get the full grammatical context. He said, then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. See, I wasn't making this up. The problem all along was they weren't thinking upon his name. Here they are, the people of God, but they're not thinking about his reputation. They're not thinking about his name. They're not thinking about what he has said is true. They're not thinking about what, what he considers. They're just seeing what they want to see. Now, I got to tell you, I'm glad the son of righteousness can appear with healing in his wings. Man, I'm so glad to get to preach that this morning. I'm so glad that the Son of Righteousness can appear with healing in His wings. And even people who have lived so long of their life seeing what they want to see can be healed by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful about that. I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for that. I'll get it out in a minute. But God does require some repentance meaning a change of mind that affects a change of action. And God is saying to his people here as the last words for 400 years before Jesus comes, you need to change your mind about how you think about me. You need to quit going to my word looking for your passes to do what you want to do. And you need to come to my word humble and surrendered to say, God, your way is best. So what you say, I will do. And if you say what I've been doing is wrong, I'll agree with you, God, and I'll stop doing it. If you say there's a better way to do what I've been doing, then God... I'll agree with you, and I'll do it your way. And what happens is, oh, this is awesome. God's word starts changing the way we think and therefore changing the way we behave. And life starts looking different. Well, how, look, I'm the one living life. How does it look different? Because you stop seeing things the way you want to see them and you start seeing things the way God sees them. And his perspective is the one that really matters because God is true and let every man be a liar. I've encouraged you to read your Bible this year and hopefully you've been following along in your Bible schedules, whether you're chronological or through the year. Can I encourage you? When you go to that book, don't be looking for licenses. Be looking for instruction. 
Don't go to the Bible and say, God, I just want some permission to do something that I want to do. Go to the Bible and say, God, what would you have me to do? And trust that his way really works. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. <clears throat> Lord, I pray that if your spirit would speak to our hearts tonight, that, Lord, we would not argue with you, we would not dispute with you. But, Lord, like the song says, with our whole heart, we will agree. And, Lord, I pray that you would challenge our thinking about what we do, about how we approach your word. God, help our hearts to be surrendered. Oh, God, please humble us, Lord, and help us to see your word as it really is, and to see you as you really are. Lord, help us to be humble before you. God, uh, help us to want to be right with you more than anything else. Thank you for grace. Thank you for mercy, for forgiveness. And Lord, help us not to turn our hearts from it, but Lord, help us to respond to that grace and that mercy with hearts of surrender. God, if you've spoken to a heart, I pray that you'd give them the courage to respond tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing 200.